Hello everybody, my name is Deacon Kyle Teets. Welcome to part three of our series examining the Christian meaning of human suffering. In the second part, in the previous video, we examined the role of Jesus Christ and his defeat of sin and death on the cross, how he accomplished this victory through his suffering. Jesus shows us how to live, how to live in a world of suffering by his life. He entered into the world of human suffering and was born as an innocent child. Growing up, he encountered suffering around him and personally as well. And then in his passion, out of obedience and love, he gave his life for all of us through great suffering. In the resurrection, Jesus is shown victorious. He has showed us how to suffer for others. Okay, well, that's great and all, but what about us that still suffer? Those of us who are suffering in this present moment. Jesus' sacrifice can seem so far away. Well, we'd say now that human suffering has been redeemed. It has been given an objective meaning. And each of us is called to share in the suffering that accomplished our redemption. John Paul II says that human suffering has been raised to the level of redemption. So today we're going to explore how our suffering can be joined to Christ, how we can participate in the act of redemption, and the continuing work of Jesus in the world. As Christian disciples, we know that we continue the mission of Jesus Christ. With Pentecost, we have received the Holy Spirit to continue the plan of salvation in the world. Our mission, the work of the church, is to continue the work of Christ. The church is the ongoing incarnation of Christ to the world. Now, this work of the church will require our suffering. And it is precisely through suffering that can, the continued work of Jesus Christ will be accomplished. As we begin our reflection today on how to unite our suffering with that of Jesus Christ, we're going to have St. Paul the Apostle as our companion. Now, St. Paul the Apostle to the Gentiles wrote numerous letters that found their way into the New Testament. And in 2 Corinthians, St. Paul gives us a description of the sufferings that he personally encountered as a Christian disciple. Here's what he says. Five times I received forty lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. I passed a night and a day on the deep, on frequent journeys, in dangers from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from my own race, dangers from the Gentiles, dangers in the city, dangers in the wilderness, dangers at sea, dangers among false brothers, in toil and hardship, through many sleepless nights, through hunger and thirst, through frequent fastings, through cold and exposure. And apart from all of these, there is the daily pressure upon me for my anxiety of all the churches. This was a man who was acquainted with suffering. Yet through all of this, St. Paul will also say this, In my flesh, I complete what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is, the church. What St. Paul recognizes here, that what is lacking in the sufferings of Christ, is his own suffering. And we're going to reflect upon this a little bit more today. Benedict XVI, Pope Benedict XVI had this to say about Paul. He said, St. Paul was a man who was ready to let himself be wounded. And that was his real strength. We're going to take a look at a few aspects of how suffering has value for our lives. Now, this is not so much new knowledge that now that we know this, everything's going to be fine. Rather, we're invited to live into the mystery of suffering. So it's not so much a movement of our mind, but a movement of the heart. And through all of this, we're going to keep our eyes focused on Jesus. Jesus, the one who offers the meaning of suffering. First, we can understand suffering as a spiritual union with Christ. St. Paul says this in 2 Corinthians, We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not driven to despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always carrying in the body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may be manifested in our bodies. Jesus died for us. It's not just a far-off notion, but something St. Paul felt could be held very closely, something very interior, lived in his personal experience. If we allow ourselves to trust in Jesus, we can rediscover our sufferings through faith. And in doing so, we rediscover ourselves through suffering. Ultimately, we realize that we're called to conform ourselves to Jesus, 
Jesus, who is the image and likeness of God. And we recognize that the image of God in Jesus is Jesus crucified, Jesus crucified, suffering, but also Jesus resurrected. St. Paul, St. John Paul II in his letter has this to say as well. When this body is gravely ill, totally incapacitated, and the person is almost incapable of living and acting, all the more do interior maturity and spiritual greatness become evident, constituting a touching lesson to those who are healthy and normal. How through our weakness, how through our suffering, we can unite ourselves with Christ. Again, we'll bring up the example of St. Francis of Assisi, who prayed to God to receive the stigmata, a sign of the love and suffering of Jesus Christ. He bore it in his own body. We also understand that we can suffer for others. When St. Paul says that he's completing the sufferings that are lacking in Christ, it's not as if Christ's sacrifice were incomplete. Rather, his sacrifice continues to remain open, remaining open to love expressed through suffering. So the essence of Christ's suffering is that it be unceasingly completed, that through our lives we might continue the work of Jesus. St. Paul says this to the Romans, I appeal to you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. I think of the example of parents giving of their time and energy, their own livelihood for their children, taking on extra work, giving that extra energy, love. Sometimes the aching, the tiredness can set in and really felt. There is suffering, but it is suffering out of love. When we suffer, especially after we have gone through suffering, we are driven to help others, especially those who suffer in similar circumstances. And this opens the door to solidarity. Think of uh, programs like Alcoholics Anonymous, where one who has suffered in this particular way might share their experience with others, helping others to move forward and overcome their experiences. Suffering also demonstrates a certain maturity. It helps us grow in maturity as members of the church. As members of the body of Christ, it's not just as if, just as if we're baptized and then we get a free pass into heaven. We must take responsibility for ourselves and for those around us. Suffering guides us into fuller membership in the church. It helps us to claim that responsibility. And more so, suffering is part of the mission of the church. In the Acts of the Apostles, we hear that through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. To share in the sufferings of Christ is to suffer in the kingdom of God. So that self-sacrifice, that suffering for the sake of others, for the church, is what ushers in the kingdom of God, is what joins us into the kingdom of God. We develop a maturity, a responsibility, so as to enter the kingdom with Jesus forever. As we saw in the Old Testament, suffering can be a test, a trial, even a very hard trial at times. But in suffering, we encounter the paradox of weakness and strength. We are reminded that we need to trust in God's strength and not ultimately on our own. We are reminded that we are created by God. We are not the Creator. St. Paul recognizes this in 2 Corinthians. He says, I will all the more gladly boast of my weaknesses, that the power of Christ may rest upon me, showing that it is not his power that he is working with, it is the power of Christ working through him. So suffering can be a sort of spiritual tempering of, for us, where we are made weak to reveal the power of God. Think of a sword being forged in a fire, where it is ultimately the skill of the blacksmith that brings it about. And the sword is, is brought low, is heated, is hammered, is... Uh, is made brittle for a time until it is finally shaped and honed and brought out, an effective product at the end. St. Paul will also say this to the Romans. He says, More than that, we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not disappoint us because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, which has been given us strength made evident through weakness. In a similar way, suffering opens us to the salvific powers of God. It was only through Jesus' weakness and suffering on the cross 
that came the resurrection. In a similar way, all human sufferings can be infused with the same power of God, manifested on the cross and revealed in the resurrection. So to suffer is to become susceptible, open to the working of the grace of God. St. John Paul II says this, It is suffering more than anything else which clears the way for the grace which transforms human souls. Suffering has a way of rooting out all that is sort of extraneous in our lives, of clearing the way, of softening us, making us low at times, but in such a way that we can receive the grace of God. God has confirmed his desire to act through suffering, evidenced on the cross. In a similar way, he can act in our weakness, in our lowliness. St. John Paul II, in his apostolic letter, will say that we might even find joy in suffering, which seems like a crazy thing to say right off the bat. But first he's talking about spiritual joy, spiritual joy which is a fruit of the Holy Spirit. He's not talking about the emotion or temporary feeling of happiness. We're not singing and dancing because we're suffering. But he says this, he says, The glory of the resurrection was initially obscured by the immensity of suffering on the cross. And it may be like that for us at times. The present suffering might impede our vision of of true wholesomeness, of life with Jesus, of our faith. The cross might block out the true joy revealed in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So St. Paul will say, I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed in us. This is to say that sharing in the cross comes about through an experience of the risen Jesus. And in recognizing the risen Jesus, in encountering the risen Lord, there is joy. He is risen. He has conquered sin and death. He has offered me salvation. What is more, true joy is found in overcoming the sense of the uselessness of suffering. Such a sense of uselessness or meaninglessness consumes a person interiorly and seems to make him a burden to others. But suffering is not just a burden. It is a call, a vocation to live in the love of Christ. It is as if Jesus were saying, Follow me. Come, take part through your suffering in this work of saving the world, a salvation achieved through my suffering and cross. Jesus is saying, Accompany me through death, through my suffering, through the cross, and I will bring you to the resurrection, to eternal life, and to true joy. I'd like to offer some questions for our personal reflection. If there's a situation or circumstance in which you are currently suffering, perhaps you can bring it to mind and perhaps take some time to pray with these questions. In the midst of my suffering, can I be honest with God? There may be many emotions going through me, but can they be turned toward praise or even thanksgiving to God? Can I pray with the crucifix, for it is the sign of suffering and love? Is this suffering a calling to a more interior reflection in my life? Suffering can be a sort of stop sign. We must stop and confront it. Is this a wake-up call in my life, an invitation to a spiritual union with the Lord? Is my suffering helping others? If not, can I trust that God sees my suffering? Many people did not recognize the value of Jesus' suffering. What am I learning from my suffering? Am I more able to understand others who suffer? Do I understand the frailty of our humanity and our dependence on God? Is this a purifying experience for me? The question, why do we suffer, still lingers with us. People react to suffering in different ways, and it takes time, even a great deal of time, for the meaning of suffering to be perceived and absorbed. But John Paul II offers us this final reflection for today. He says that Jesus responds to our question, our why do we suffer, from the cross. He says, Furthermore, he who asks this question cannot help noticing that the one to whom he puts the question 
is himself suffering and wishes to answer him from the cross, from the heart of his own suffering. Next time, in our final video together, we will answer some lingering questions about suffering and look how to serve those around us who suffer as well. God bless.